delighted to have Teresa Nicholas and Joanne Pritchard Morris to discuss the life of Willie Morris. They have each given programs here in the series before, and we're delighted to have them back. Here to say a few words about today's speakers is Leela Salisbury, director of the University Press of Mississippi, which published Nicholas's new biography of Morris. Thank you, Chris. It's always good to see a, a room full of people, and I'm so uh, pleased and very honored to be able to introduce today two publishing veterans, uh, and veterans in the best sense of the word, Teresa Nicholas and Joanne. Uh, Willie Morris is also special to me in that he's, he's Mississippi's native son in many ways, and actually the first book when I came to Mississippi eight years ago, the first book I read was North Towards Home. I was talking to John Evans at Lemuria and said, you know, what's, what's my Mississippi reading list so I can begin to understand the place? And that, that was the, the first book that was recommended to me. So this, this publication is particularly special. I'll, I'll say a little bit about Teresa. Uh, she was vice president and director of production for the Crown Publishing Group in New York. She's also worked as a freelance writer with pieces appearing in Delta and Mississippi magazines, NPR's opinion page, the Saul Literary Magazine, and the South Writ Large. She's also been a travel writer for Fodors in Guatemala and Mexico since 2000, and she's been on the faculty of the Columbia Publishing course in New York. Teresa is a member of Penn and the National Book Critics Circle. This biography of Willie is the second book that she's published with us. Her, the press is delighted to have published another book by her, her memoir, Burying Daddy, Putting My Lebanese Catholic Southern Baptist Childhood to Rest, which we published in 2011. <laughs> that's possibly why, you know, just reading it here, that's maybe one of the greatest titles we've ever had for one of our books. And uh, Joanne Pritchard Morris uh, did graduate work in folklore and southern culture at Western Kentucky University, taught high school in Yazoo City, where she met Willie Morris. She worked as executive editor for the University Press of Mississippi from 1983 to 97, and in 1990 she became the second wife of well-known writer Willie Morris. She's a supremely gifted editor and writer, and her books include Barefootin', Life Lessons from the Road to Freedom, written with civil rights activist Unita Blackwell, and Yazoo, Its Legends and Legacies. Last year, she edited Once in a Lifetime, Reflections of a Mississippi First Lady, the memoir of Elise Varner Winter. And both of these women, I, I feel very fortunate to have connected with the press, uh, working and publishing books. The, the making of books is kind of this strange and mysterious pursuit sometimes, so it's especially wonderful to work with people who you know, know the mysteries and the behind the, the curtains operations of, of publishing, and I think they often make some of the very best authors. So without further, further delay, uh, Teresa will tell us a little bit about this biography. And I, I just wanted to mention these biographers we're doing are sort of an informal series. We realized um, we can't get enough about Mississippi topics and especially uh, biographies, but wanted to do uh, short biographies, very accessible, heavily illustrated to introduce people anew or for the first time to some of these topics, including younger readers, but we also have been delighted uh, by how much uh, adults have, have really um, attached themselves to these books. And even for topics that we think we knew well, uh, new information comes out, and Teresa's done a really good job in, in bringing out a lot of new information about Willie, so she'll tell us more about that today. Well, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Leela, uh, and thank all of you for being here today. Um, when Joy and I started talking about this uh, event today, we talked about focusing more on Willie's years in Jackson, even though the biography covers cradle to grave, and even, in Willie's case, a little beyond the grave, um, because as probably many of you know, Willie published quite a few books posthumously that were in the pipeline when he died. So anyway, we're going to try to focus on Jackson, but I would like to start out just a little bit, I can't help it, being from Yazoo City, about Yazoo City. Uh, we know the name of Willie Morris and the town of Yazoo City to be inextricably linked. After all, Yazoo City, with its colorful stories, such as the tale about the witch who burned the town down in 1904, who can resist that, has played a starring role in Willie's writing. So have the boyhood stories Willie told about living there, stories about Skip playing football and, yes, driving a car, stories about 
leaving old moon pies and dead rats in mailboxes around town. And in our then dry state, about them sending a case of bourbon to the Tuesday meeting of the ladies of the First Baptist Church. <laughs> I'm sure that really happened. These and other Yazoo stories appear in Willie's books, such as North Toward Home, Good Old Boy, and My Dog Skip. In a more serious but still personal vein, Willie wrote about the integration of the Yazoo Public Schools for Harper's Magazine in an article a cover article that he later expanded into the book Yazoo Integration in a Deep Southern Town. The writer Joan Didion, one of my favorites, has written that a place belongs forever to whoever claims it hardest, remembers it most obsessively, wrenches it from itself, shapes it, renders it, loves it so radically that he remakes it in his own image. I think that was Willie and his Yazoo. But our capital city, Jackson, was also a very significant place for Willie. First and foremost, Willie was born here in Jackson on Thanksgiving Day, 1934. He even lived here for the first six months of his life before moving to Yazoo City with his parents, Ray and Marion Morris. But let me back up a little. Let me first talk about Willie's people, his family history, and their connection to Hines County. Willie's father, as he wrote at North Toward Home, was, quote, a native of those sulfurous hills south of Nashville who had come to the deep south of all places and, of, and at all times during the Great Depression. Ray Morris came to Jackson to work for the Standard Oil Company Although Ray's father had served in the Tennessee Senate with Cordell Hull, Willie described his father, even after coming to the city, as, quote, country, in the way he was tuned to its rhythms and its cycles. He and his Tennessee people were simple, trustworthy, straightforward, and good as grass. Instead, it was Willie's mother's people who captured Willie's imagination when he was growing up. He characterized them in North Toward Home as, quote, emotional, changeable, touched with charisma, and given to histrionic flourishes. They were courageous under tension and unexpectedly tough beneath their wild eccentricities, for they had a close working agreement with God. They also had an unusually high quota in bullshit. <laughs> that was Willie. He had arrived in Mississippi in the 19th century, or excuse me, the people, Marion Morris's family, had arrived in Mississippi in the 19th century when it was practically frontier. These are some of Willie's forebears that he wrote about often. Coles Mead, Willie's great, great, great uncle, who was, quote, the first acting territorial governor of Mississippi, who tried unsuccessfully to catch up with Aaron Burr when Burr took off down the Mississippi River on his curious scheme to conquer the territories belonging to Spain. There's also Henry Foote, Willie's uncle by marriage, whom he called his true family hero. Willie describes him as, quote, one of the authentic 19th century Southern Americans, a fighter for the Union, and an uncompromising enemy of the Southern extremists. For a time, he edited a newspaper called The Mississippian, published first in Vicksburg and then in Jackson, until the outbreak of the Civil War, one of the most influential Democratic papers in the state. Willie goes on to say that Foote was, quote, one of the most exciting politicians and stump speakers on the national scene in mid-century America, and an erratic, courageous bantam of a man who once exchanged blows with Jefferson Davis and who defeated him in 1851 for governor of Mississippi. He was a U.S. senator and a southern moderate who fought the secessionists, but who ultimately remained with the Confederacy, serving in the Confederate Congress. Willie's true family hero also once drew a pistol on Senator Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri, right on the floor of the United States Senate. Here's Willie's take on the event, as written in North Toward Home. 
colleague managed to snatch the gun away while Benton was inviting my uncle to go ahead and shoot. <laughs> this was a widely published fiasco, which the American Minister of London called extremely humiliating to those who represented the young republic overseas. Apparently, everyone overlooking the fact that Senator, Bur Senator Benton deserved shooting. <laughs> <laughs> Willie's mother's family descended from the Harpers of Virginia, founders of Harpers Ferry. Willie's great-grandfather, George W. Harper, came south and met Willie's great-grandmother in the governor's mansion with, when her uncle Henry was governor. George W. Harper was editor of the Hines County Gazette in Raymond, and he fathered 16 children, including Willie's grandmother, Mamie Harper, the youngest, in 1878. Willie said of her, she was the one who was the repository of those valiant tales and banished troubles who made that old time come alive for me. George Harper was a major in the Confederate Army, a member of the state legislature, and mayor of Raymond. Willie liked to tell the story, which we now know is untrue, <laughs> that when Sherman's troops came through Raymond, they threw George Harper's printing presses in the town well. Here's another favorite Harper family story from Willie and North Toward Home. During the Civil War, as I was told it as a boy, the family cow disappeared. My great-grandmother, with seven mouths to feed, went to the captain of the federal troops and complained in great agitation that his soldiers had stolen her cow. Find this lady a cow, the captain ordered his staff and then graciously escorted her home. Mama said he was such a nice man, my great aunts would say to me as late as the 1940s, sitting in their dark parlor on North Jefferson Street in Jackson. Such a nice, honest man who cared. But when the original cow wandered home the next day and the herd increased to two, <laughs> Yankee chivalry was not rewarded with the return of the merchandise. <laughs> The Harper legacy in such cases would teach me a great deal about how to roll with the punches. <laughs> Mamie Harper, Willie's grandmother from Raymond, married Edmund Percy Weeks from Bastrop, Louisiana, and they had a child, Willie's mother, Marion Harper Weeks. She studied here at Millsaps College and at the Chicago American Conservatory of Music. When she arrived in Yazoo City, with her Steinway Grand in 1935. She cried over leaving Jackson for that bedraggled outpost where most of the streets were gravel and where they still talked about the great flood of 1927. <laughs> so during the summers when Willie was a boy, he would board the Greyhound bus in Yazoo City to visit his mother's relatives in their brick house on North Jefferson Street, just north of Fortification in Bellhaven. Living in the house were Mamie and Percy, Willie's grandparents, and Mag and Sue, his great aunts. He described his experience this way. In Jackson, I did not have to go to church unless I was foolish enough to volunteer. I could remain a heathen there for days on end. There was a big magnolia in front of the house and several fig trees in back and the number four bus came past every 15 minutes if I wanted to go to Capitol Street or Battlefield Park or Livingston Lake or the State Museum. As a boy, Willie carved his name, Willie M., into the trunk of that magnolia tree in his grandparents' yard on North Jefferson across from the old Jitney Jungle. The house has since been torn down, but some of the tree is still standing though not in the section with Willie's name. Mamie, Willie wrote in North Toward Home, the youngest of the 16 Harper children, kept that curious household going. She had been born in 1878, two years after the federal troops pulled out of Mississippi, and she told me that when she was a baby, riding with her mother in a carriage near Raymond, whenever another carriage approached, her mother would hide her in the back seat. Such was her shame on having 16 children. When the preacher came to have Sunday dinner with the Harper family, Mamie always got the neck in the wing because, 
That was all that was left when the plate got down to her corner. Grandfather Percy worked in a potato chip factory at the corner of Farish and Griffith Streets, and Willie wrote, Every afternoon at four, he would come home smelling of potatoes <clears throat> and fetch from his satchel two bags of chips, crisp and hot from the oven. Sometimes, Willie went with Percy, Percy to the factory. He wrote, We munched on potato chips all day from nine to four and came home so full of salt and potato grease that we had to have five or six glasses of water apiece at supper. Percy, Willie went on, would take him riding on the city bus all over town, sometimes as far as Clinton to see the German prisoners of war. Willie has been interviewed as saying that one of these prisoners leaned down to pet his dog through the fence and gave him two cans of pet evaporated milk, a precious commodity in 1942 Mississippi. In return, Willie gave him two pieces of bubble gum that he had bought in a store across the street from the King Edward Hotel. In the family's garage, Percy constructed model steamboats for Willie and regaled him with tales about boat races on the Mississippi River. They scaled fig trees, at Livingston, swam at Livingston Park, and banged on toy drums. It seemed there was nothing that Grandfather Percy wouldn't do. Percy also contributed to Willie's self-confidence. Willie wrote, suddenly, for no reason at all, in his slow, shy drawl, he would whisper, Willie Morris, man of the hour, or, boy, you can do anything you want to if you just set a mind to it. They also attended baseball games, which Willie called the ultimate joy of my childhood summers. They would walk to the state fairgrounds to watch the Senators, a Class B team in the Southeastern League. One final story about that Jitney jungle. Willie wrote in a profile of Eudora Welty and Vanity Fair in the late 90s about an encounter he had with Miss Welty when he was eight or nine. He had been food shopping with his great aunt Mag, who whispered to him as they walked away, she writes those stories her own self. <laughs> so the legends of Yezu City and Willie's own childhood stories showed up time and again in his writing. But Jackson exerted its power over Willie's imagination too. Though his visits to, through his visits to his maternal grandparents and great aunts and the colorful stories he heard from them about his ancestors and through the area's attractions, everything from baseball games to visits to POW camps. And his grandfather, Percy, may have exerted the most influence over Willie. He inspired Willie's love of pranks and jokes, his everlasting sense of fun. So now we'll flash forward to the late 80s. In 1988, Joanne Pritchard, Finn, the executive editor at the University Press, began working on a book with Willie that would pair his essays with the art of William Dunlap. That book, the award-winning Homecomings, published in 1989, the same year that Willie and Joanne began seeing each other. Willie, who was living in Oxford as writer in residence at the university, started spending more time in Jackson, staying downtown at the Sun and Sand Motor Hotel where he was writing Faulkner's Mississippi. In May 1990, he and Joanne became engaged. They married that September in Joanne's backyard on the corner of Northside Drive in Normandy, holding their reception at Hall and Mouse. <laughs> Willie then moved permanently to Jackson. He had come full circle to the place of his birth, where as a boy he had spent all those happy days visiting with his maternal grandparents. On his return, he was proud of both the Jackson of his memory and the city he experienced in his day-to-day -day life, and he inspired others to be proud. He invited many of his out-of-town friends to visit and get to know the capital. Whether his visitors were from New York or Hollywood, Austin, Texas, or Oxford, England, he wanted to connect them to Mississippi and to connect the state to the wider world. 
Malcolm White has said of Willie during this time, he was the Pied Piper, the cultural czar of Mississippi. In 1994, Joanne and Willie moved around the corner into a house on Brookdale. The 90s proved to be happy and productive for Willie, a decade in which he published almost as many books as he had in all his previous years. These included Faulkner's Mississippi, My Two Oxfords, After All It's Only a Game, New York Days, My Dog Skip, A Prayer for the Opening of the Little League Season, and The Ghosts of Medgar Evers. But that wasn't all. He also completed the manuscripts for My Cat Spit McGee and for My Mississippi, and he mulled over his unfinished manuscript for his novel Taps. Willie lauded Joanne's talents, telling friends she's the best editor in the South. She became first reader of his manuscripts. They would sign their notes to one another, the writer and the editor. And now I'm going to turn this over to both writer and editor, Joanne Pritchard Morris. people before me. Um, first, I want to thank Teresa for writing this wonderful book and for the University Press for publishing it. Uh, I can assure you that Willie would be as proud as, possi as he could possibly be over uh, the book itself and the writer and publisher. Um, he was crazy about Teresa and um, and, probably, and and uh, he loved living in Jackson. And maybe the only thing that would have made him love it anymore would have been had Teresa and Jerry lived here then. Though Teresa may not have enjoyed it quite as much because she would have gotten a lot of 2 a.m. phone calls <laughs> <laughs> from Willie to talk about her work or his. He liked to do that sort of thing. He did really love Jackson, and as Teresa said, it brought him full circle. He liked the concept of coming back to the place of his birth. And of course, in Jackson, as Teresa has said, he was not only in the city of his birth, but between, right between Raymond and Yazoo City. And we did a lot of driving around in Jackson and in Raymond and Yazoo City, uh, looking at the, you know, mostly places of Willie's memories. He had, he would say he's, he has memories on every uh, street corner. And sometimes they would just flood him. Uh, in Yazoo City, it was almost too much sometimes. And he would really never get out of the car in Yazoo City. We would drive around and he would talk about Yazoo City, I think it was, there was something almost too much about being uh, that close to Yazoo City. Um, he, when he first came to, get to Jackson, the thing that I, that as I recall, that impressed him the most about his life was his serenity, the serenity of living in Jackson. In Oxford, which is, of course, a small town where he'd been living for 10 years. He knew everybody, and everybody knew him. Of course, everybody knew him in Jackson, too, but it was a much larger place. A lot of people knew him in Jackson. It's a much larger place. And in Oxford, he went out every night, and he brought people home with him, and so he brought a lot of this on himself, and then everybody was wanting to come visit him all the time. And he had a hard time sometimes getting work done. In, in Jackson, nobody ever bothered him. <laughs> he, he was kind of amazed that he could get his work done. And he, he used the term serenity a lot about being in Jackson. Of course, my term for, the, for when he's being in Jackson was excitement. <laughs> I'd been serene in Jackson for a long time. <laughs> um, let's see what I'm 
got here. A couple of comments about where he lived. I went by the reason, one of the reasons I was almost late today, is I went down Poplar Street to uh, see if I could find the house where his, so I could tell you where he, his mother and father were living when he was born. And it's at the corner of Poplar and Monroe, I believe. He thought it was somewhere else. He thought it, but uh, a few years ago, someone whose name escapes me at this moment wrote and sent me, and if you're in this room, tell me. <laughs> uh, was, well, they were looking at their deeds to their house, and it had been owned by uh, Ray and Ray Morris and Mrs. Marion Weeks Morris. It's on the southwest corner of Monroe and Poplar. And then, of course, the house that, just mentioning that tree, the house that his grandparents lived in across the back of the, uh, now the McDades, where the tree is, there's another interesting story. He, he was upset, I will tell you, and every time we went by there, it, he would say, I don't know, my, my initials are gone. They were there just not many years ago. And he, I think, interpreted it as somebody uh, being unhappy with him and des you know, taking the initials down. Soon after he died, somebody, and again, I don't know who it was, because I, it was in a uh, was in a fog, and brought me this little napkin, and unwrapped it, and gave it to me, and it had the initials from the tree that that person had taken down as a memento, and they returned. It was returned, but. I wish that he had returned it a little bit earlier. <laughs> um, let's see. You know, Willie had a Willie had a way of just sort of making wherever he was his own. He did that in at the University of Texas. He did it in New York City. He did it um, Long Island and in Oxford. And of course, when he came and and he did that in in Jackson as well. And since he already had a real connection here, uh, it was even easier. But, and the kinds of play he liked, um, and Jackson was kind of about, was about friends and family. For the first time really in a long time, since really he was a boy, he had a big family. He automatically had a big family, not just David, who was, who was his son and David's wife, but he in, all of a sudden had Olive, uh, had my children and their wives and husbands and significant others, and then uh, extended families in a lot of directions. And he, he really enjoyed that. He loved having people over and he made wonderful menus uh, if he had a dinner. The, important thing was not the food, which was usually takeout. <laughs> and he would have all the family members' names, and he would name all the, the foods after some, you know, the people who were there. And he would, down at, down at the bottom, there was always red wine, uh, let's see, white wine and Coca-Cola, vintage, and he, these things are all given vintages, including the Coca-Cola. <laughs> and then he would have the, a list of the, the entertainment. And it always, it might be, and the one I've got up on my wall right now, which was from the, from 1998, I guess. And the first thing on there was, discussion of Kenneth Starr and 
uh, flu. <laughs> and then, this, then the, it went on down, and it always ended with lies, gossip, and persiflage. <laughs> so he loved having family around. Um, his favorite restaurants, he, he, in Oxford he went out every night, so I was determined I, that we were not going out every night. I could not go out every night and work, and he didn't really want to. He was happy being at home, and he decided that he would cook, and he fixed spaghetti and various odd assortment of things. And one night, he decided, one Christmas, he was going to cook a goose. <laughs> he invited um, Harriet Kirkendall and John, whom he, and Harriet, he had known in Yezzy City, and he invited Norman and Lou Mott to come over from Yezzy City, and we were going to have a goose. And I never cooked a goose, and I did not not know anything about geese, nor did Willie, <laughs> nor did Willie. But he found, a, he found a recipe, and he followed the recipe, and then I had set the table, and everybody was sitting out there, and I put the food on the table, and I got the goose out of the oven. The goose was about this big <laughs> by the time it finished cooking, and it was swimming in grease, in, in goose grease. And I think we each maybe got one bite of goose. <laughs> but that was the kind of cooking he did. Nothing daunted him, you know. Whatever he wanted, he tried it. Um, he loved going to, the kind of restaurants he liked to go to were the kinds that he didn't like the fancy new restaurants. Uh, he loved um, the Mayflower and the Shells. He loved Hal and Mouse. He, let's see, Bill's Burger House. And um, then Crescelles, at, at one point, had a Marcel's over there in our neighborhood. And so we went to Marcel's. And he always knew, he always had found his table. It was going to be usually toward the back or in a corner somewhere. He found where his table was going to be. He knew all the waitresses, all the bus boys, all of the owners, and, you know, anybody that worked there. And, and he remembered everything about them. And so, and he liked, he loved going out, because after writing all day, where he was very much by himself, uh, if he felt like seeing people, he, that's, we went out. And I cannot tell you the number of parents who came up to Willie and said, the only book my child ever read in school was Good Old Boy. <laughs> And then the, the kids would come by too. But let's see what else. Um, <clears throat> Willie loved talking to smart, bright young kids. He was a great affirmer. And it was really fascinating to watch, to listen to Willie talk to young people and hook into their world and listen to them, ask lots of questions, and then tell them that yes, they could do that. They could be a writer or they whatever it was they wanted to do. And, you know, I had, after he died, I had many, many letters from people saying, Willie changed my life. And there would be one sentence he said, or sometimes it would be the look on his face. So he did have this wonderful ability, as I see a lot of you around here that probably know as much about William Jackson as I do, but um, he did have this remarkable ability to 
uh, affirm and encourage people, including me. When we were first working on that book, I was a little uh, daunted, really, to, that I was going to be editing Willie. And, and I also did a, we, I put together this uh, interview of Willie, I interviewed Willie and Bill Dunlap and was editing it together so it appeared as a con so it was more of a conversation taking out the questions and so forth and he would it was a long interview and he would write i've got the letter somewhere he wrote um you can do this i know you can do this you will do it very well and then he would proceed to tell me, well, I think that first of all, you need to do thus and such and thus and such, and I know you will do it. So <laughs> he, um, he was both a, an incur an, a farmer of me as an editor and, uh, and a teacher as well. Uh, part of the... Let's see. And he did write it, do write as many books as while he was in Jackson as he had written the previous. Six. The first book came out in 1960. Can you hear me? The first book came out in 1967, and um, he wrote. And, and then the last two books he wrote were My Mississippi, and I don't remember if. I don't know if you've mentioned the My Cat Spit McGee. That was the last one. And um, I'm going to read a little bit from, from that in a minute. You know, he called Jackson the old bold. He, the, at that time, the city had just come up with the, the, the slogan, the bold new city. And he called it, I always called it the old bold. <laughs> Because, you know, he really did see the present and the past all together at the same time in Jackson. And um, he certainly saw uh, the, um, the old places and had memories of so many of them. So it was always the old bowl for Willie. And he... So after about three or four years, we moved to Brookdale and had the, and our backyard uh, looked down on, looked over upon the front yard of Governor Winter and Mrs. Winter. And Willie absolutely loved living across from William Winter and he would play pranks and make jokes and so forth. But, and they had a dog named Fritz, and Willie's cat, Spit McGee. Fritz and Spit McGee uh, corresponded. <laughs> uh, often, very often, they corresponded. And they were, you know, very literary uh, uh, pets. It's amazing. And, uh, and Fritz, or the new dog, wrote a when Spit McGee died, we got a, a note from, it wasn't, I don't know if it was, was Fritz still living then? It was Fritz. So, um, so I'm going to, since this was about the last book he wrote, and he did not live to see it published, but he, it was finished, and uh, several months before, and it was published in February, following his death in in August. And he talks a lot about, he talks some about the town. He's talking a lot about the cat, but um, but it, it, and, but it's all kind of of a piece. So I was gonna read you, and this I think will give you a sense of the serenity and feeling of happiness and that Willie had being in Jackson. All right. The cat woman, that's me, had been looking for a larger and older house, 
larger and older house for all of us. At first, I paid her precious little mind, even as she conducted me through the Faubourgs, like the historic Bellhaven neighborhood, where I was born only a couple of blocks from Eudora Welty's house before my parents moved to Yezu, and where my grandparents and great aunts lived years ago. She undertook this mission with a single-mindedness that it would, have, would have shamed Prince Metternich at the Congress of Vienna. Then one day she chose an unaccustomed detour to work and fortuitously found the house, she said. She returned home with the news, glorious as a meadowlark, and forthwith took me to the place. It, see, it's better to have Willie write about it than to actually do it. <laughs> Which is one of the reasons I like to write about it. Uh, I mean, read about it. Read. It was indeed a splendid old dwelling in a serene and graceful vicinity, only a mile or so from the house on north side. A substantial two-story with spacious rooms and gently sloping roofs and an acre of land dotted with towering white oaks and post oaks and elms and sweet gums and magnolias and old camellias and intricate gossamer azaleas and secret little wooded enclosures and traversed at its downhill periphery by a sizable meandering creek he called, I called Purple Crane. This place had a patina of continuity. I can only confess in my heart especially after my many previous years in what might only be called bachelor pads, that it was the house I had wanted all my life. But I was hesitant to tell her right away. <laughs> I have a feeling we're going to buy this house, she said. Well, what are we going to buy it with? Why don't you write a book about your dog, Skip? The cat woman knew, of course, how to get an embattled, how to get an embattled writing man. The house had been built in 1940 by the son of a man who had been governor of Mississippi twice and had not been elected either time. And for this he had made Ripley's Believe It or Not. For as lieutenant governor in both 1927 and 1943, he had succeeded on the deaths of the presiding governors. And that was Murphy, Dennis, Dennis, Dennis Murphy. Oh, that was another thing he liked about this neighborhood when, after we moved there. William Winter told him this was the governor's row and all the various ex-governors and who lived there or had lived there. So he was the uh, only family, his was the only family to live in the house before us. Every Christmas afternoon of my faraway childhood, I drove out in this direction the new section of town with my grandparents in, the, in their vintage Dodge to look at the Yuletide decorations. As we traveled down the old Canton Road, could I have mystically divined that then that a mere hundred yards or so down a side street was the very house in which many years later I would dwell with a beautiful wife and seven cats, including a big white one with blue eyes, one blue eye and one gold. Was it waiting for me there all along? I've always been obsessed with the classic paradoxes of time, of time warps, of mystical visitations into the distant past. No single book by anybody ever affected me more acutely in this regard than H.G. Wells' The Time Machine, which transported me back and forth in time-specific locales so graphically that it made me quite deranged. And this brand new vicinity beguiled me with fantasies, with fancies of the human beings who had dwelled here years earlier along this very creek, their lost voices, their transient joys and hopes and fears, and this surely had to have been heightened for me because of the simple actuality of ownership. As I sat in the backyard watching the cats establish their hegemony, I tried in my imagination to conjure what this particular swath of the Lord's earth was like 200 years before, let us arbitrarily say. 
So I went down to the Eudora Welty Public Library, which I had previously drawn upon for my random investigation of cats, and even to the state archives, to derive some tangible notion of what might have been transpiring on this exact ground in A.D. 1800 and beyond. My precise property and my cats was only about four miles from the old Natchez Trace, the historic Indian Trail, and then Stagecoach Roadway from Natchez to Nashville, the great artery to the old Southwest with its pioneers and explorers and entrepreneurs and notorious highwaymen. So this backyard had not been all that remote from the bustling, from bustling and egregious human activity. It was then a neighborhood of dense hardwood forests through which the Choctaw Indians could roam and hunt freely. Our surrounding land was soon bought by white settlers at a dollar and a quarter an acre. Later in the century, our site was very near Grant and Sherman, Burn with, uh, Grant and Sherman's Union lines in the Battle of Jackson, during which Sherman burned down most of the town. Out of the mists of history, then, one might surmise that the view from my present workroom, which looked down over the yard, and the one afforded my cats from their perspective in the trees were Choctaw Indians, isolated farmers, and Yankee soldiers. And a survey of our exact property taken in AD 1821 amazingly indicated the same giant post oak trees that still flourish here. The place did indeed have continuity, although I have no solid documentary evidence that any of the long departed human souls who traversed this soil actually themselves had cats. <laughs> Um, I'm happy to take questions, and Teresa is, I know, and uh, I could talk for several hours about Willie in Jackson, but maybe some of you have, yes? What did you have, or what does archives have in terms of video interviews with Willie and so forth? Uh, not very much, but I have a huge box in my house <laughs> that um, I would love to um, pass along if I can get a copy of it. <laughs> yes. What projects was Willie talking about doing that he never got to that you wish he had money? Well, he always talked about taps, and he was always going to rewrite taps. and. What pro and so, and he was trying to finish my Mississippi, but he had another book that he talked about for years called The Chimes at Midnight, that he named it that, and it was going to be about his time in Oxford, England, and it was a, something that actually happened. Somebody went over the one of those old walls, and he. Had, I, it's a complicated story, I can't remember, but there were some pages that he had written earlier, and he always planned to go back to that. But he would take, you know, somebody might just mention something, and he would go into that. He, you know, he, it was always personal. Whatever he did was always personal. It was always connected to history. He made it historical as well, and um, a lot of times political, or involving political uh, events. But as far as any specific thing, oh, that, that's not true. That is not true at all. <laughs> I don't know what I'm thinking about. Um, that's far away. I mean, that was in the... He was the very day, how can I forget this? The very day he died, beginning a book about his father and baseball. Mm -hmm. And um, he had all his note cards. Willie really did a lot of research and he did make note cards. He, 
He told me after he was gone to please tell people how organized he was. I'm telling you, he was very organized. <laughs> and he had all the he had all his material all written out in notes and so I'm very sorry. And that he did not get to write that book. It was going to be really good, and it was called this one, one for my daddy, one for my daddy. Yeah. Yes. May I tell one? Please, you tell as many as you want. <laughs> right after Willie moved to uh, Purple Cane Creek, uh, the phone rang one night about 10:30, and I was already in bed. And and he said, uh, Governor, he said, I hate to bother you this time of night, but uh, I've just been looking at the deed to my house over here, and I own half of your front yard. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Willie, I want to also remind you of one thing. I have an easement on your property that permits my dog to play in your backyard. <laughs> Some of Willie's friends continue to take small, polite, and affectionate shots at you because they say, when you and Willie got married and moved to Jackson, you were very protective and sheltered Willie from some of these uh, old buddies who like to go out and drink all night with him. And that was very productive from a literary point of view, but they still missed seeing Willie. Would you say that's, that's an accurate uh, description? I didn't shelter him. <laughs> um, I, he, may not, he did not go out drinking as often, but I didn't tell him he could. People also said I got him to write, and he would say that, he would say that. She locked me in my room. Uh, <laughs> he got up, he wrote every day. Uh, most of them, during football season, he wrote seven days a week, but he took off Saturdays during football season. And it's, when he was writing, he was writing, uh, but he didn't, you know, he was writing regularly. He didn't start until, oh, two o'clock in the afternoon or something like that. And he would write four, five, six hours. And, or he would do something, think, write, research, but he was in a room focused on that, and I had absolutely nothing to do with that. <laughs> um, I did, maybe on one or two occasions, uh, appear sometimes when, oh, I know what I did. Uh, he would bring people home from the, he would bring the buddies home from the restaurants and places, and I had to go to work the next morning. So I would go on to bed, and it did happen a few occasions that I was uh, want to yell down for the guys below to be quiet. <laughs> but people give me a lot of give me credit that I don't deserve. I just he had a but he really liked having a home and a family and a house and you know who doesn't but Willie had been kind of bumping around for many years and so he he liked that yes Teresa what prompted the new book and what does it cover well I'm glad you asked that <laughs> oh, that's a good question <laughs> because it allows me to say something about my friend John Langston who's the University Press uh, John Langston who's experiencing today his first day as a retired art director from the University of Press. The first full day. Um, the press, and, and Leela knows this well, had established this biography series. The first book was about Eudora Wealthy. I think the second one was about Margaret Walker. And John said, well, the press would like to do a book about Willie. Would you like to do it? And of course I did want to do it. John and I had met Willie when we were high school students. And I had corresponded with Billy for a few years on and off, and um, just he just meant a lot to me, and I was just hooked on the subject, and so that's how it came about. 
Well, um, I think we probably should close. It's 1 o'clock. I want to thank you all for coming. It's really a good group. Thank you. Selling books. <laughs>